Ferry. Ours was the last of the cars to squeeze onto the ferry, all our prayers directed to the controllers of traffic finally answered, yes, we were blessed. On the car radio that long day, those who delighted in promoting our guilt had spoken of God become flesh, more precisely of a deity in diapers, an image that seemed to touch on the reasons for our travel, family, the habitual Christmas, deity in diapers, wow, this theology we thought we could live with. Granny had laid her corsage with its braids of tinsel and arabesques of green spray paint on the back seat beside her and complained she was tired. No wonder, all of us talking non-stop and everyone on the radio talking non-stop and mostly nonsense at that. A few days before, she complained, at the shrinks, she had failed all the tests that had her spell words backwards, retrace geometric shapes backwards, count backwards from one hundred by sevens or eights. Every one of the clocks she'd been asked to draw came out totally wrong, their numbers all bunched together in a low corner or off to one side. We tried to console her, trying at the same time to hide our own anxieties over how long it took us to spell world, for example, backwards, to count past 93, 86, 79. We said, how can doing anything backwards be a sign of either failure or success? Unconvinced, she refused later to join in our game of naming the relatives waiting for us across the street game that our kids quickly won. She kept looking at them, at us, then down at the grey water as the ferry slowly took us across, the muscles of her face twitching as if there were something important she had to remember. Keeping up appearances. Winter apples dotted trees without leaves, a mist slowly washing the black branches and fruit away, as in Chinese landscapes, hints of more solid mountains here and there in the background poking through, a traveller or two perhaps in a straw hat, neither tea nor wine house close by, nor bordello, or was I confusing cultures again? and it seemed important that the mist was not so pure as it had appeared at dawn, that the autumn fires outside had been giving up their smoke all day, offering at the same time a simple solution to the mystery of the missing leaves, while the neighbors, in front of wood fires, a little drunk on medicinal wine, grappled with questions no less difficult to answer, exhausted too from working all day long to hold the apples steady in the wisps of the trees even as smoke and mist worked to break our concentration that kept the fruit solid its colors true midlife crisis a robin appears to have fallen out of love with his image in the window stupid and more stupid against the glass beating his brains out what little he has with every blow scrawnier. No idea what he thinks he's protecting, what love nest he may have built in the alders nearby. Here, one robin looks much like another, a bird with orange feathers and much drab. A creature that likes worms and makes a fuss over them. Stupid against the window for days, he is finally slowing down just a little his brain numbed or heavy with the suspicion that whatever stirs in the glass may be neither robin nor male. Time and again he eyes his own image aslant, as if feigning lack of interest, a huge abstraction keeping him busy. Mowing the lawn and putting it off. 1. The grass only last week's straw, this week too lush again to cut. Cut anyway, wet around the blades and a green glue, electric motor blue, smoking. Over and over till winter, then over. Greener in December, not growing because of these accidents of latitude and longitude, our city every third winter white. In the wet of it, dry enough by a fire, we plan to take this engine apart, rewire it, make it go. Two. 
Starlings, those European imports, but good for nothing. Chatter on the telephone poles, branches slackening lines, each year refusing harder to leave. Three. Taking turns, we have no better science for this not quite pattern that forces us through ever tighter green circles. Our neighbor sucks in his paunch round and round the green, his face with every turn redder. We cannot, cannot be like him. We must be as stable now that the electrons in our heads are spinning clockwise like his. Seascape with donkey. Horse tails in the air. On the water, rooster tails. And no horses and no roosters. Somewhere must be the tail of a donkey and a tailless donkey pinned to a wall, two-dimensional. Imagine a real likeness of a donkey, real pins, a solid wall. Anything can be pinned to it. An oyster catcher whistling that flies into fog and is gone, or a freighter that blows its own horn and slides out of this world, or the brain itself grasping these details, holding on. How one part connects with another, or fails to connect. Maybe I'm the donkey, always needing to be reattached to the same two or three things on the earth, or the air, or the water. When we grew up, everything had its head in the clouds that day. The woman in her third month, the adolescent writing his first poem, already saying everything too often. The co-ed with more than one secret she'd have been only too happy to tell. The young high jumper about to reach new heights, though not as he wanted. His friends who found themselves inside a poem for the first and only time, many of them never to stray so far from their homes again. The pine tree beneath which nimbus clouds had been summoned, the moss and pine needles stuck in fabric, the hard cones, the houses in which everyone slept or tossed all night unable to sleep, head in the clouds and still unable to sleep, the chimneys, the TV antennas, the actors declaiming in the black and white night owl movie, the night owl, all with their heads in the clouds, the cigarette, the coffee, the burned toast, the diary with its brass lock, the wallet with its two color photos of one person, the body with its body in cloudy fluid, all their heads in the clouds that day, the day itself with its head right in, and the clouds still bunching up thicker.